Well, hello, friends. Welcome to the Serenity OS update for January 2021. Uh, before we begin, let me tell you about sponsorship. So the Serenity operating system and all of my content about it is always going to be free and open source. Uh, but if you would like to support my work and maybe someday make it possible for me to do this full time, then there are three donation options. So I'm on GitHub sponsors and Patreon for those uh, interested in making a monthly recurring donation. And I'm also on PayPal if you would prefer to make a one-time donation. And you can find links to those services in the video description. Uh, and of course, huge thank you to everybody who has already supported me in some way on these platforms. Um, that's really awesome. And uh, welcome to all the new supporters who have joined in the last month. So uh, let's talk about January. Um, something that happened this month is that we were featured twice on the Live Overflow channel. So Live Overflow is a YouTube channel focused on security. And um, a lot of people who hadn't seen the system before um, got to know about it for the first time. And uh, it's been really fun to see all the new people coming in and messing around with it. Uh, and it also sent me down the path of uh, looking at system security again because of so many uh, new people with an interest in security coming in. And yeah, so <laughs> it's been a, a very security focused month for me. I ended up doing a whole bunch of exploit videos where I um, show some flaw that I found and then show how to exploit it and then how to fix it. Um, and then after that, I switched to doing mitigations. So uh, I've also implemented a whole bunch of new mitigations to prevent or make more difficult exploitation in the future. So uh, I guess we can start by looking at some of the mitigations. So uh, one thing that we now have is uh, ASLR in the user space for dynamic libraries. So if we start, for example, the browser here and we run Brendan's excellent PMAP program, um, we can see that the libraries are now jumbled around here in the address space. Previously, they will all be laid out sequentially uh, at the start of the address space, and uh, they would always be in the same order. But if we are go, uh, go ahead here and uh, start a new browser, we can see uh, da, 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 that uh, indeed they are just in a totally different order, different locations. And uh, yeah, so that's basic ASLR. And that's definitely something that would have made one of my exploits much harder. So that's cool. And then uh, another thing that's new is uh, strong WX XOR X. So uh, it's now much, much harder to introduce new code into a running program because we no longer allow um, writable memory to become executable. Um, and that's something that I borrowed from the PAX and protect mechanism that they have over in Linux. Uh, and I think that's a, that's a very good hardening as well. And then um, something else is that we now put our system passwords in a shadow file. So previously the passwords were in the password file and they were world readable, but now we have shadow file instead. So that's pretty cool. And yeah, obviously, I can't look in that file. Um, and um, a whole bunch of other things. So by the way, you'll notice here when I'm hovering these, so we used to have uh, hyperlinks here, but I've actually switched these to, um, they act a bit more like icons in the file manager almost. So a single click doesn't actually activate something. Uh, but you can still drag it and um, you can still open it, you just have to double click. So, by the way, that was a little weird, the title here. <laughs> um, yeah, so you have to double click and that's something that was pointed out by Brendan that it's way too easy to accidentally click one of these and I think, I think this makes a lot of sense. Um, and then uh, other stuff is uh, we now have some at exit hardening, so um, at exit handlers that you register with libc, they now reside in a piece of read-only memory that we only make writable during at exit itself. Uh, so um, that prevents an attacker from 
uh, gaining code execution by um, putting a function pointer directly into the at exit vector. So it's like a little thing, but I, I like it. Uh, it was an excellent idea from the OpenBSD project that I just borrowed. Um, and then we have increased stack smashing protect protection that was added by Brian. So we now build with F stack protector strong, I think it is. Um, and we have fixed a whole bunch of um, slash temp race conditions that we had. So Brandon did some very good analysis on um, our system server and the way that we handle um, directories and some links and slash temp. And I think we've addressed um, most of those issues. So that's been really good. And um, as part of that, I also implemented the symlink hardening stuff that Linux does, where uh, there are additional restrictions on symbolic links in um, sticky bit directories. So um, that's pretty good stuff. And um, uh, there's so many mitigations, but <laughs> I just want to I just want to mention all of them. So um, we now do additional ELF validation um, that was done by Brendan as well. So now we do a whole bunch of additional checks before we allow an executable to run. Um, I put limits on various things like how many arguments can you put on the stack of um, process that you launch? Um, how much environment can you provide to, uh, um, to exec? Stuff like that. And um, I've also added a new pledge for ptrace. So uh, if you want to use ptrace, you now have to specifically pledge ptrace. So, um, it's, it's its own promise now. Uh, previously it was part of the proc promise, but I figured that ptrace is such a specialized thing. Like most programs never want to ptrace. So let's just put it into its own promise category. I think that's pretty good. Um, and then uh, there were some other cool things too. Like, uh, so we have this thing called the launch server, which um, is how we spawn de desktop programs with a URL. So um, for example, if you, like if you open a file here, then launch server is the thing that finds that, oh, text editor is probably a good thing for this. Uh, for this file type. So uh, launch server now has a pledge-like mechanism where uh, when you connect to launch server for the first time, you can actually tell it, hey, I'm only ever going to ask you to launch uh, these types of things. And then if this process were later compromised and it would try to ask launch server to do something out of the ordinary, then launch server would just refuse. So uh, it's a little thing, but, but I, I quite like it. Um, and it, it fits very well with the whole pledge theme. Uh, anyway, so a whole bunch of things about that. Uh, and then another area of mitigations, I guess, is the browser I should talk about. So uh, the browser is now multi-process by default. So um, what you see here is uh, running in a separate process per tab. And if we bring up the um, system monitor, we can see that, uh, let's sort by PID. So we have a web content process for serenityos.org, and we have a separate one down here for the local file content. And these are now running as unprivileged users. Uh, they're running as the web content user. Um, so it has no access to our home directory. And if we look over here, we can see that it is pretty tightly uh, pledged as well. So uh, has very limited access to um, stuff like uh, the file system. So it, it doesn't have any access to our home directory. It doesn't have any access to the file system meaningfully other than uh, fonts and uh, system color themes, stuff like that. And of course the uh, HTML error pages and stuff. But uh, that's definitely a huge step forward. And um, it's not, not only is the rendering and parsing of the web content segregated into its own process, but we also now have full isolation of image decoders for web content. So whenever you see an image on a web page, we actually 
uh, sent it over to an image decoder process um, to decode it. So that doesn't run in the web content process either um, because, you know, historically uh, binary image formats are kind of prone to, to decoder bugs. So I figured it's better to, to, you know, get ahead of the problem early and isolate them in their own process. So we do that as well. Um, so this is all really exciting. And of course it breaks some features in the browser that, um, took advantage of the fact that everything was in a single process, but um, moving into the multi-process world by default means that now we have to actually go and uh, deal with those problems and implement those features in a multi-process friendly way. Um, but uh, I, I, I did one browser exploit in a video, if you saw, and um, it really kind of bothered me how easy it was to uh, do stuff once I had taken control of the browser process. So. Uh, part of my motivation for um, switching to multi-process and implementing these process separation mitigations uh, was just to make my next browser exploit session much, much harder and more interesting. So um, yeah, so that's, that's stuff that's new in the browser. And of course, we've also done a whole bunch of work on the browser. Uh, there is now a built-in ad blocker, um, which blocks Google, Google tracking services and stuff like that by default. Um, and you can actually, uh, let's see, show dot files. Yeah. The content filters are here. So these are, <laughs> these are the things that we block by default. Um, and you can add your own things if you like. So this is pretty neat. Of course, uh, you know, we can barely show ads correctly yet, but it doesn't mean we can't start blocking them early. Um, so other stuff is um, we now generate constructors and prototypes from the IDL interface descriptions. So previously we would only generate uh, like a DOM node JS bindings, but now we also generate a node prototype and a node constructor. So uh, that brings us a lot um, closer to like actual web compatibility by having a more well-rounded um, JavaScript bindings interface. Uh, and the window object in JavaScript is now an event target. So you can register event listeners on the window object. This is something that very frequently broke on random web pages that you could try to open. So that's a nice step forward as well. And then uh, I started working on CSS Flexbox a little bit, but need to do a lot more work on that um, because I wanted, wanted Linus's website to um, load correctly, but <laughs> we still have quite a ways to go. Um, but uh, speaking of Linus, uh, Linus has been doing a lot of really great work on uh, libjs as usual, just uh, fixing all these little things, little correctness issues, and taking care of fuzzer bugs, which is super awesome. And um, Another thing that Linus did, which I super love, is adding way more features to the <laughs> to the crash reporter. So now we have these tabs here where you can learn more about the crash process. Um, you can see like why did it crash? What was the signal? What was the state of the CPU registers at the time of the crash? Um, what was the environment of the crash process? What arguments had you passed and, and so on? Um, very, very cool stuff. And uh, Luke also did a lot of cool work on the browser, um, working on the um, JavaScript uh, execution stuff, for example, like the way that we load and execute JavaScripts and uh, adding various little web APIs. So um, building a browser is something that just takes a long time and has a lot of tiny little tasks. And it's super awesome that more people are helping out, just doing a little bit here and there, because that's... Um, it might may not seem like it and if you're just taking um, a look at what's happening in the moment, but in the grand scheme of things, uh, you got to keep adding those little things over time, it turns into a browser, uh, <laughs> I hope. Uh, anyway, another thing that is new is we now have a space analyzer program. So this was added by Mart 
And you can see here that the Git port is particularly huge. And so this is a tree map of the um, file system, basically. So you can see here what takes up space in the file system. And I have a Python installation here. And uh, I guess the GCC is the largest, uh, or, or no, Git is definitely the largest, but GCC is kind of large as well. Uh, if we look at our own libraries, we can go to user, lib, um, wait, that's user local lib. Oh, uh, I'm still learning how to navigate this thing. User lib. So we can see libweb is 10.4 megabytes. Uh, I don't know. I, I find this program visually fascinating, um, but I need to get better at navigating it. Regardless, thank you very much, uh, Mart, for implementing this and for building this cool tree map widget, which I'm sure we can use for other stuff as well. I would really like to um, use this for some kind of memory usage visualization as well, not just disk space usage. And I think it has some pretty good potential for that. Um, oh, speaking of new things, I want to show you a little silly thing as well. <laughs> so we now have a desktop cat dog. Uh, it's called cat dog and it was added by Richard. Um, I don't know why it's called cat dog, I guess because he couldn't decide if it looked like a cat or a dog. It looks like a cat to me, but um, I'm not going to argue with that. So that's pretty cute. Just follows the mouse cursor. Uh, but I'm going to turn that off because uh, it's a little distracting. Okay, so I guess Something that was new last month is the GML uh, playground. So um, didn't spend that much time on this because I got so into the security stuff, but uh, it's still here. And something that um, Ali worked on here is autocomplete. So it will now suggest, even without you requesting it, it will like suggest what you could type. So here it suggests some classes. I can I can step through them, although it doesn't scroll, but I step down with the keys. That's a bit weird. <laughs> but but we do have um, sort of proactive autocomplete happening. Um, so that's was added by Ali, and I think we need to do a bit more work on it, but promising feature. And um, oh, something else that's happening that's really cool is that um, Nico started looking into high resolution support. So uh, we can actually switch the system to, I guess, uh, something like that. So now we are in high DPI mode and um, like 2x basically, rendering everything at 2x size. And you can see here that uh, only the mouse cursor and these window buttons actually. Um, take advantage of the 2x mode. So we haven't ported, um, we haven't, well, the code is 2x aware, but um, a lot of the graphics need to be uh, updated to take advantage of it, right? But uh, this is pretty exciting for people who use high resolution displays. So the system is headed towards becoming um, high DPI aware. So uh, pretty exciting. Um, thank you very much to Nico for for all your work on that because that has been a lot and um, I'm especially happy about it not just because of the feature but also because uh, it means that Nico had to do a lot of work on our painting infrastructure to support scaling and the painting code just uh, um, needed a lot of love let's say and it's been great that uh, somebody has been looking at that um, so something else related to painting, by the way, if we bring up pixel paint here, we can see that it now actually allows us to export as PNG. So uh, Pierre has added a PNG encoder. Thank you very much, Pierre. This is something that we didn't have before. We only had BMP um, and now we have PNG. So that's very, very nice. And in the system monitor, we now have a new uh, graph style for CPU usage and memory usage graphs. Let me speed those up a little bit so we get some data points. 
so Tom implemented these new graphs that uh, sort of have a more interesting visual breakdown of both time and memory. Uh, we can now see like time spent in total versus time only in the kernel. And we also see um, sort of a more honest breakdown of memory usage. And especially the memory usage graph is good because uh, as of this month, we now um, are much more strict about making memory reservations. So previously we would sort of happily hand out memory that didn't exist. But now we have sort of scaled back on that and uh, we will try to make reservations of memory until we, um, we notice that we can't really, can't really promise you more memory because we don't have any more. <laughs> so um, there are still some situations where you might, uh, might run into trouble, but uh, there's been a lot of great work by Tom on just improving um, how much of the truth we tell programs about memory availability. So that's cool. Um, and let's see, uh, what else did I want to show? I guess, oh, some file manager stuff maybe. So um, you can now drag and drop these things onto the breadcrumb bar. And uh, that's something that I added a while back and I also added these little rectangles that show up. If you are uh, threatening to drop something on something else, then you now get this little drop target um, rect around the thing. So I think that turned out pretty cool. And a little thing, but um, we no longer show the scroll bars here if we don't need to. So the scroll bars only show up once something doesn't fit. Um, that's something that always kind of annoyed me, so I went and fixed that. See, scroll bar? No scroll bar. <laughs> Important. Um, what else? The help app, I added a simple sort of welcome index page or a home page here. Just, um, I guess just to, to mess with the system a little bit and add something friendly looking and also um, it was nice to see that uh, we can put more stuff into the help system than just manual pages. So um, I'm not exactly sure where we're going to go with that, but it was, it was nice to, to get a chance to use a, an icon in the help system. Uh, eh, we'll see. We'll see what we do with the help, but uh, it's good stuff. And uh, there's been a lot of work on the kernel this month. So um, let's see. So one thing that's new in the kernel is that we now have netboot support. So uh, Jean-Baptiste got the system booting over the network. And um, we now have RAM disk support to facilitate that. So that's really awesome. And Jean-Baptiste has done a lot of uh, great work on the kernel just to make it able to start in a netboot environment. So it's pretty exciting. And uh, Luke has done a lot of great work on um, making our kernel run in VirtualBox and VMware. So that's something that we've historically been a little bit bad at and that's now improving uh, quite a bit. Very cool. And um, in Hack Studio, which uh, hasn't seen that much new development recently, but uh, something that you cannot really see here is that uh, we now have the start of a C++ parser. So Itamar has been working on a C++ parser to, um, well, initially just to support autocomplete, but uh, who knows what we'll do with that. Uh, there's also uh, there's also some, some ongoing work on a very, very simple um, C++ compiler, but um, it's a bit too early to say where that's heading, but it is interesting. Um, so, oh, see, <laughs> Hack Studio crashing. Need to take a look at that. But, but look how nice the, uh, the crash reporter is. See, it even shows the icon and everything. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so um, 
fuzzing. Fuzzing is still ongoing, so we're still fuzzing continuously on OSS Fuzz. Uh, so thank you very much to Google for running that service. It keeps finding these uh, weird little bugs. And um, thank you very much to Linus and Ben and whoever else uh, fixed fuzzing bugs because um, it's cool to have fuzzing, but we need to actually fix the bugs. So I'm super happy when I see people uh, pick up these fuzzing bugs and work on them and fix whatever the problem is. Because, you know, sometimes they can be kind of silly problems or boring problems, but it's still good to fix them. And also, Luke has um, gotten us running on the Fuzzily, Fuzzily, I don't know how to say it, um, JavaScript fuzzer and found a whole bunch of issues with that. So thank you, Luke, for um, adding more fuzzing. And um, we've seen some progress on USB support, I guess. So um, I don't know if I'm, I can't really show much of that here, but uh, Jesse has been uh, continuing work on our USB implementation. And we have some, some very bare bones uh, support for that <clears throat> coming in. And um, not quite ready for uh, devices yet, but it is looking slightly promising. Uh, and uh, uh, there's so much in the kernel. Tom has been doing a lot of work on uh, preparing for uh, multiprocessing. So uh, we can now actually run in SMP mode, but it is a little bit flaky, um, it hangs sometimes, and um, we do have a bunch of race conditions that need to be figured out. But uh, it is now very possible to boot and run the system with multiple processors, so that's super cool. And thank you very much to Tom for working on that. And a lot of the um, refactoring and cleanup that comes from that work has been really great as well. So now our scheduler is uh, much, much better than it ever was because it uses uh, thread priority queues instead of one big flat uh, list of threads. And um, that's cool. So something else that I did this month was I got rid of the Serenity OS shared buffers or shabuffs. Um, they were a sort of uh, our proprietary shared memory mechanism that we've had since day one uh, of the GUI. And I've replaced them with um, this thing that we call anonymous memory, or anonymous files, rather. Uh, so an anonymous file is sort of like memfood on Linux, where you, um, you can create a file that will never exist on disk, and it can't be put on disk. It only ever exists in memory. And then you still get a file descriptor, and then you can send that to another process. And that's now how the whole GUI is implemented, and all the memory sharing and bitmap sharing between processes is done with uh, anonymous files instead of the strange, goofy shared buffers mechanism. So now we're uh, much more Unixy in that way, which I really like because it sort of reduces the set of um, idiosyncratic things that we need to um, think about and model, especially for security considerations. Um, yeah, oh, and one last thing I'd like to show you is that we now have a port of Python 3.9 thanks to Linus, so, um, or 11 times 11. Uh, <laughs> this is a um, very nice up-to-date port of Python, so uh, Linus did the hard work of figuring out everything that was needed in our uh, core libraries to support this and made it happen, so thank you very much, Linus, for that. Um, I know that we, we don't focus a lot on ports uh, in the system, but it is cool when you see this uh, big project like Python or GCC or whatever um, get up and running on Serenity because it, uh, it, it's nice that it just works um, after some hacking. Anyway, I think, uh, I think that's everything I wanted to show you today. Um, it's been a really fun month. It's been, uh, I've been learning so much about security and especially from doing exploits. And I almost feel a little bit guilty for not spending more time on the sort of the desktop system and um, GUI stuff. But 
um, as I like to say, like I, I always encourage people to do the thing that interests them the most because that's when we build the best software. So I've been doing the thing that interested me the most this month, which was digging into security and exploitation. And I've learned so much. And um, I really want to thank Live Overflow for featuring us and uh, sending all of uh, the security curious people our way because uh, I had a lot of interesting conversations with people checking out the system and um, that's been really great. And um, thank you to all the people who, who reported whatever little uh, security issues that they found. Um, that's also been super awesome. Um, and something I forgot to mention last month actually is that I was on the CPP cast podcast with uh, Rob Irving and Jason Turner. And um, it gave me a chance to talk about sort of about the background uh, of Serenity OS and my background. And it's something that I don't often get a chance to talk about on this channel. Although I suppose I could if I, <laughs> if I wanted to, but um, I usually talk about whatever I'm working on right now. So it was a nice chance to, to um, give some background. So if you haven't checked out the CPP cast episode I was on, I will put a link to that in the description here. And I will also put links to the live overflow videos about Serenity. Um, but yeah, that's it for this month. It was a great month. Thank you, everybody who hung out and worked on it. Um, and welcome to all the new people. I hope you find something interesting here. Uh, and um, I guess we'll see what we do in the next month. Thanks for hanging out.